On the 26th of May 2013, 22-year-old Jamie Reynolds lured his friend, 17-year-old Georgia Williams, to his home on Avondale Road in the town of Wellington in Shropshire, a county in the UK. This was under the pretense of her helping him with a photo shoot so he could become a professional photographer. Georgia didn't know that she'd walked into a trap set by a deviant, extremely dangerous sexual sadist who had spent years fantasising about hanging a girl and then having sex with her dead body. Georgia agreed to a photo shoot with a noose around her neck, not knowing the setup was real. Reynolds pulled the rope and hanged Georgia whilst kicking away what she was standing on. He then watched her slowly strangle to death in front of him before violating her body. Reynolds had planned this day in great detail for months and the police recovered a story that he'd written about Georgia and what he was going to do to her which included the line, quote, I can't wait to see you dance for me. I like my girls dead. At his sentencing, it was assessed that Reynolds was a serial killer in the making, a man who had been stopped before he'd ended the lives of others. But a serious case review showed the incompetence of various agencies and the fact the warning flags were obvious for years, but no one acted on them. Welcome to Evil Among Us. Jamie Reynolds was born in either 1990 or 1991 in the county of Shropshire in the West Midlands of England. There was some trauma in his early years, with him being exposed to his biological father, beating his mother, as well as him being physically and emotionally abused by him. But his mother eventually fled the family home and began a relationship with a man who had become Reynolds' stepfather. This man, in contrast, was very supportive and Reynolds spent most of his childhood in a middle-class household living in the town of Wellington. His mother and stepfather later tried to raise the alarm about his behaviour to authorities, so it seems he came from a pro-social household. However, despite this outwardly stable upbringing, from around the age of 16 years old, Reynolds began down a path of sexual depravity, which was originally confined to the internet, but then spilled out into the real world. Court records show that for years prior to the murder, Reynolds was obsessed with extreme pornography, and had been addicted to this since he was around the age of 16, but he likely started looking at this even earlier. Records released after his sentence show that Reynolds frequently visited YouTube channels which showed violent scenes from films, especially those where women were murdered. This progressed through him following channels which uploaded videos showing simulated acts of violence against women, especially strangulation, with titles such as quote, Girl Strangled by Boyfriend, Two Ladies Strangled on Bed, and strangled by husband. Eventually, Reynolds progressed to watching snuff films, videos depicting real life death, including murder and horrific accidents. He signed up to various adult dating websites, looking for sexual partners who he could use and abuse. On one of these, he stated his favorite porn genre was quote choking. Reynolds was found to have bookmarked numerous websites which showed extreme pornography, including simulated rape. One video that he kept returning to showed a man choking a woman using a piece of rope and then having sex with her unconscious body. Many of the videos that Reynolds watched had terrible echoes of what he himself did years later. It's clear that Reynolds was obsessed with acts of physical and sexual violence towards women, particularly strangulation and then rape. Both these acts are rooted in power and control. The act of strangulation is a very personal, up-close behaviour. It's an extremely visual act with the perpetrator being able to look into their victim's eyes while they, the one in ultimate control, chokes the life out of them and sees the light going out of their eyes. And then, whether unconscious or dead, they're at the ultimate mercy of the perpetrator who can use them any way they want and they cannot fight back. In the case of Reynolds, it's clearly found the stress of these women sexually arousing and wanted desperately to be the one with his hands around their throats. Soon, Reynolds' online fantasies began bleeding into the real world. He began taking photographs of girls he knew from social media and ones he himself took and began to superimpose pictures of nooses around these girls' necks. Reynolds would claim to be an amateur photographer to friends as cover for him taking pictures of these girls. In addition, police recovered 40 graphic short stories which he'd written, again about girls he knew, where the theme was always the same, with these girls being strangled, either to the point of unconsciousness or death, with Reynolds then having sex with either their living bodies or their corpses, but it appears his fantasies mainly revolved around the latter. By the age of 17 years old, Jamie Reynolds was ready to take his fantasies into the real world, 
and this is when he made his first attempt to kill and rape a girl, and it's also the beginning of the story about the ineptitude of the authorities which allowed this predator to remain at liberty. In January 2008, Reynolds, aged around 17, lured a 16 year old girl back to his home with the promise of paying her money if she would pose with some pictures for him. He clearly been fantasizing about attacking this girl as he had superimposed an image of a noose onto a picture of her. When she got to the property, it's clear that she felt something was wrong and when she refused to go upstairs or into the kitchen, Reynolds attacked her, placing his hands around her throat and attempting to strangle her. She managed to fight Reynolds off and flee the house and called the police. When the police arrived, the girl was found with swelling and red marks around her neck. When the police entered Reynolds' home, they found pictures of unknown, naked females being strangled and suffocated, and pictures of girls that he knew, including the 16-year-old he just attacked, with nooses superimposed onto their pictures. Reynolds was arrested simply for assault, and later spoken to, when he simply claimed not to remember the incident well. He assured the police he had no interest in viewing pornography in the future and was not interested in strangulation. For some inexplicable reason, Jamie Reynolds was simply given a final warning and sent on his way. Around this same time, Reynolds' mother and stepfather contacted the mental health services about their concerns related to the contents of his computer. Reynolds was assessed by a doctor who, after speaking to him and seeing the pictures, determined that he posed a quote, significant risk to others. And then, nothing. Absolutely nothing. It appears the mental health services simply sat back to see what would happen. It doesn't appear there was any information sharing with the police or anyone else. Instead, they told Reynolds' parents to go to the police to raise concerns themselves. His stepfather, Julie, went to the police with printouts of photographs he found on Reynolds' computer, including the images of nooses superimposed on girls that he knew and pornographic images of a man raping and then strangling a girl to death. He told them that he was concerned what his stepson might be capable of. The police simply noted this interaction on their system, but did nothing. They didn't link the two incidents, and realised they needed to look again at Reynolds, and conclude correctly that the incident involving the 16-year-old girl was far more serious than they'd originally believed, although, in my opinion, this was blatantly obvious. The pieces that different agencies held show that Jamie Reynolds was by the age of 17 years old, an extremely dangerous young man, who was clearly a potential rapist and likely murder in the making, but there was no communication and no one took the lead on trying to stop him. In addition, despite Reynolds being found with pictures of girls he knew, clearly potential targets, none of them were warned and they only found out about the disturbing images after his arrest for murder. The issue with this lack of action is that someone like Reynolds basically becomes more emboldened He'd basically tried to strangle a 16 year old girl, got caught, and there was absolutely no consequence to his actions. I think that Reynolds took this as a green light to escalate his behaviour, which he did with horrifying consequences only five years later. Reynolds was able to wear some semblance of a mask of sanity in public, but he was known as an odd, creepy individual. He would fixate on women and repeatedly ask them out, even if they had boyfriends or repeatedly refused his advances. He appears to have been a fantasist, creating scenarios in his head where he was already in relationships with these women, despite them being clear they were not interested. When he finally got the hint, he would post self-pitying messages online, stating that he was quote, cursed, and quote, whenever I arrange dates, they either never happen, or the girl magically gains a boyfriend. He was clearly a man who had difficulty taking no for an answer, and this would come to a head in 2011, when he harassed a girl repeatedly trying to get her to go out with him. It got to the point where she confronted him to tell him to leave her alone. In response, Reynolds reversed his car into this girl. Police were called, but I cannot see this led to any formal action, but also no link was made between this incident and the offence in 2008 or the concerns reported by his parents. It was later found out this girl was the subject of one of Reynolds' stories and featured in one of the photographs found on his computer with a noose superimposed around her neck. Clearly, Jamie Reynolds was a man who felt entitled to these women, seeing them as objects, and no doubt, if they had agreed to go out with him, they would have quickly been subjected to serious acts of sexual violence. If they rejected him, they would be punished. How dare they stop him from getting what he wanted. Reynolds appears to have been obsessed with many girls, but he had a particular fixation with a girl called Georgia Williams.
Georgia Williams was born on the 8th of September 1995 in Shropshire and was, by all accounts, an extroverted, kind and popular young lady. She grew up in a happy and loving home with her father Stephen, a police officer, her mother Lynette and her sister Scarlett. Stephen later described his daughter as a quote, sweet and loving girl. She was bullied in junior school but didn't let this change her personality and when she went to Urkelwood Technology College in Telford she became a student mentor and a student counsellor and in her last year when taking her GCSEs she became head girl. She was also a Royal Air Force cadet and had aspirations of being a medic in the armed forces. It's clear that Georgia was a person who wanted to help others and wanted to devote her professional life to this. However, it was this caring personality trait that would eventually lead her to fall into Reynolds' trap. The pair lived around five minutes away from each other and met in the Haygate pub in Wellington, which put on live music. How long they knew each other is unclear, but it doesn't appear it was long, likely less than a year before the murder. Reynolds took an instant shine to Georgia and asked her out repeatedly, despite her making it clear that she wasn't interested in him in that way. He went online to moan about how hard done by he was that Georgia would not go out with him, leaned to one person responding, quote, get over it, grow up. However, as I've already mentioned, Reynolds was not a man who took no for an answer, and whilst outwardly he stayed calm and passive, she had become the focus of one of his disturbing stories, and he had superimposed a noose onto a picture of her and restraints on her wrists, and by January 2013, he'd begun to plot her murder. Towards the end of January 2013, Jamie Reynolds began writing a story entitled, quote, Georgia Williams in Surprise. I know that title doesn't make any sense, but that's what it was called. He revised and rewrote parts of it until approximately the 2nd of May 2013, three weeks before the murder. In this story, he described how he convinced Georgia to come to his house, wearing her red hair up in a ponytail and wearing red lipstick. He then described her performing oral sex on him in the kitchen before blindfolding her, tying her hands together and telling her he had a surprise for her. He then wrote about taking her upstairs and getting her to stand on a box whilst placing a noose around her neck before tightening it whilst telling her that she was going to quote, dance for him, referring to the spasmodic leg movements seen on hanging victims whilst they suffocate. Reynolds then described tightening the noose whilst sexually assaulting Georgia and then continued to do this when he kicked the box away whilst watching her slowly die from strangulation. When she was dead, he talks about having sex with her body. Reynolds went to great lengths to obtain the items he needed for his sick plan. He bought a black leather jacket and shorts, which he intended for his victim to wear, and filmed himself masturbating over this clothing. He also ordered handcuffs, rope, and cable ties. He also worked on constructing a bar that he could hang a rope from, and achieved this by taking an oar that was in the attic and wedging it between two walls, so he could hang the rope over this. He also undertook research to learn how to make a hangman's noose. All of these items Reynolds had by the middle of February 2013, and whilst Georgia appears to have been his primary target, I've no doubt there was an aborted attempt to follow through with this plan before her tragic death. Specifically, towards the end of February 2013, Reynolds invited a girl around to his house whilst his parents were away for the weekend. She was again someone who appeared in one of his stories, and he'd inevitably been masturbating over the pictures he created of her with a noose around her neck and shackles around her ankles. The girl came to Reynolds' home, and he then locked the front door and claimed he couldn't find the key. The girl refused to move from the hallway, as she inevitably sensed something was wrong. Reynolds was trying to get her to go upstairs, and also to stay the night, but she refused. He spent an hour pretending to look for the key, and, by the end of the time, the girl was screaming and threatening to break a window to get out of the property. Reynolds then miraculously found the key, unlocked the door, and the girl fled. Unfortunately, Georgia would not be so lucky. Reynolds' absolute commitment to finding someone to kill is shown by the fact that in May 2013, the month of the murder, he sent out messages to approximately 15 girls on Facebook asking them to help him out with a photo shoot. He told them the shoot would involve a simulated hanging. Two or three girls responded and said they would help, and Reynolds organised for two of them to come to his house at the end of May the day after he committed the murder of Georgia. With regards to Georgia, unfortunately Reynolds played on her good nature, her desire to help others. At this point, 
he was working various part-time jobs and moaned to her about his lot in life and how he wanted to find a real career. He wanted to become a professional photographer, but in order to do this, he needed a portfolio. He didn't have enough money to pay someone to pose for him. Georgia, wishing to help her friend, said she would be happy to pose for him. He told her that the photo shoot would involve a simulated hanging and that he would want her to wear specific things and asked if that would be okay. She said it would be fine. I know inevitably it will come up in the comments about why she agreed to this. I think there are a couple of things to point out. Firstly, her age. She was 17 years old and perhaps a little naive. But I think the most important thing to say is that hindsight is a wonderful thing. I don't think many of us even think about the potential that we may know someone who's a murderer or a rapist. Even if Georgia had some reservations, I think she just wanted to help out someone that she thought was in need. The date agreed for them to meet was May the 26th, 2013, a day where Reynolds' mother and stepfather were away and he had the entire house to himself. On the 26th of May 2013, Jamie Reynolds left his job at a shop in Wellington around 4.15pm. He then went to a pub for a drink. He was described by those who saw him as being in a happy mood. He then returned home and began to set the scene for the murder. He wedged the oar between two walls upstairs and draped the hangman's noose he'd made over it with the free end coiled on the floor. He also placed a box under the noose. He then took a picture of this setup, which was recovered later. During this time, he was in contact with Georgia, checking she was still coming round and asking her to wear red lipstick and put her hair up in a ponytail, just like in his story. He also texted the two other girls who he'd arranged to meet, asking if they were still available, with him inevitably having backup plans in case Georgia didn't come for any reason. Between 6.15pm and 6.31pm, Reynolds sat watching extreme pornography, including videos showing women being strangled, with their hands tied behind their back, or hanged from a beam. Another video he watched showed a man strangling a woman and then having sex with her apparently dead body. This material he took from his collection, which, by the point of the murder, had expanded to 72 videos and 16,800 still images. Georgia left her home at about 7.50pm, telling her parents that she was going to Reynolds' address and that she was going to model for some photographs for him. She arrived around 7.55 and changed into the leather jacket and shorts that Reynolds had bought. Reynolds documented every moment, no doubt to revisit it later, by taking pictures from the moment that Georgia walked through the door. These photographs have not been released to the public for obvious reasons, given what they went on to show, but they are described in court records. The first images show Georgia, smiling, wearing the outfit stood in Reynolds' kitchen. The next set, a few minutes later, shows Georgia stood on the box, with a noose around her neck, with her hands apparently secured behind her back. She's again still smiling. At some point between 8.28pm and 8.50pm, Jamie Reynolds grabbed the loose end of the rope and pulled it taut, forcing Georgia onto her tiptoes so she began to strangle. He tied the rope to a banister and watched her gasping for breath. After watching this for several minutes, he untied the rope and pulled it with all of his might so Georgia was fully suspended in the air. He likely also knocked the box out from under her and he sat and watched her die. The next set of photographs must have been nothing short of horrific to see, as they showed Georgia suspended, clearly dead by this point. Over the next two hours, Reynolds engaged in various sex acts with Georgia's dead body, including raping her orally, vaginally and anally, with him taking her corpse from room to room to degrade her body in various locations. He photographed all of his sickening acts. Reynolds also took items of Georgia's jewellery as some kind of sick trophy and hid them somewhere, with them never being recovered. When he was finished, he set about covering his tracks and trying to get away with his crime. Reynolds had apparently learned the passcode on George's mobile phone. How is unclear, but he accessed this device and sent a message to her mother saying that she decided to stay at a friend's house and be back sometime tomorrow. Reynolds also texted the two girls he was meant to meet the next day and cancelled his plans. He also wiped his devices. Reynolds then loaded George's body, the clothing that he bought her, and the rope into his stepfather's work van. He planned to dump George's body, but had to wait until after his sister had come round for a pre-arranged visit on the morning of May the 27th, 2013. After she had gone, he drove the van to a remote area of woodland, outside the city of Wrexham in Wales, a journey of around 40 miles. On the way, 
he stops at a service station for petrol, as shown by this CCTV, which is haunting. Note that he's standing mere feet from the broken and violated body of a 17-year-old girl that he'd savagely murdered. He then dumped her body, but Reynolds made a fatal mistake when his van got stuck in the mud and he had to be helped by a passing driver. Another motorist, although I'm not sure why, took a photograph of the van by the side of the road. So, what did Reynolds do after this? Did he panic? No, he bought himself a new watch and went to the cinema. Those who saw him and came forward later said that he was acting completely normally, like a man without a care in the world. However, Reynolds knew that questions would be asked and so he fled to Glasgow in Scotland and checked himself into a hotel. He'd already concocted a feeble excuse as to why he travelled there. He was depressed and had gone there to kill himself. So he travelled almost 300 miles away from home to kill himself. Right, that seems logical. However, his time on the run would be short-lived. Unfortunately, due to the text message that Reynolds had sent, her family didn't start to worry about Georgia until the 27th of May 2013. When she didn't return on this date, they desperately contacted her friends to see if anyone had seen her. On the 28th of May, she was reported to the police as a missing person. It didn't take long to form the link between Reynolds and Georgia, as he was apparently the last person she was going to visit before her disappearance. His route to Glasgow was traced. He was found to have checked into a hotel in the city centre, which is where he was arrested on the 29th of May 2013, initially on suspicion of kidnapping. This was just three days after the murder. Officers from West Mercy Police made appeals to locate Georgia and asked the public to help trace the movements of the van that Reynolds was driving. The person who took the photograph of him stopped by the road, contacted the authorities and gave them the image, placing Reynolds in an area outside Wrexham. The police also searched his home and seized various items including electrical devices, such as computer and memory sticks. On the 30th of May 2013, Reynolds was transported down south and was questioned over two days on suspicion of kidnapping Georgia. Reynolds stuck to his ridiculous story that he'd gone to Scotland to kill himself, but the police had already built a strong case against him quickly. They confronted him with the images they'd recovered of Georgia dead from his memory stick, despite his attempts to delete them, as well as the image of him standing by the road near Woods in Wales. Reynolds then changed his story, stating that he had flashes of memory of him dragging Georgia through some woods, but he couldn't remember how he got there or what had happened before that. Whilst police were questioning Reynolds on the second day, the 31st of May 2013, they had launched a search of the area in Wales where the photograph of Reynolds had been taken, and they soon found the body of Georgia. She had simply been dumped in open ground, naked, with no effort to conceal her. The police then had to tell her parents that their daughter was dead. Jamie Reynolds still claimed he couldn't remember anything, but it didn't matter. The case against him was airtight, and late on the 31st of May 2013, he was charged with Georgia Williams' murder and remanded into prison to await his fate. On the 3rd of October 2013, Jamie Reynolds made his first appearance at Birmingham Crown Court where he pleaded not guilty to the murder of Georgia Williams. However, on the 2nd of December 2013, the first day of his trial, he pleaded guilty to her murder. No doubt he knew the writing was on the wall. He would inevitably be convicted, and his only play was to plead guilty to try and get time off his sentence. However, he was sorely mistaken. The judge, Mr Justice Wilkie, adjourned the case of Reynolds to be assessed by a psychiatrist, Professor Peckett, who produced a report for the 19th of December 2013, the day that Reynolds stood to be sentenced. Justice Wilkie highlighted the premeditated and calculated nature of Reynolds's offending, but made particular reference to the psychiatric report, with him stating, quote, Professor Peckett is of the opinion that you do not suffer from a recognised mental disorder, nor do you have an abnormality of mental functioning. The only narrative that stands up to examination is that you wanted to hang a girl and have sex with her corpse to fulfil a long-standing necrophilic fantasy. He has expressed the opinion that you are intelligent and plausible, are capable of learning new tactics and strategies, and had the potential to progress to being a serial killer. While you pose an ongoing risk to your own life, you also pose a grave risk to women, and will continue to do so for the rest of your life. The judge indicated he fully agreed with this assessment. He then sentenced him. 
for the murder of Georgia Williams, Jamie Reynolds was sentenced to a whole life order, meaning that he will never be released from prison. After his sentence, Reynolds' barrister stated that he had resigned himself to spending the rest of his life in prison. However, he quickly changed his mind, and in April 2014, Jamie Reynolds appealed his length of sentence. This was denied. I've read the refusal of his appeal, and I love this type of legal language, with very flowery and professional words being used to say, hell no, if we could put you under the prison, we would. At the time of his sentencing, Reynolds was only the second person in the UK to be given a whole life order due to killing a single person, as this type of sentence was usually reserved for people who had committed multiple murders. The first was Mark Bridger, who abducted and murdered five-year-old April Jones in October 2012 in Wales. Since then, they have both been joined by others, including Thomas Mayer, who murdered MP Joe Cox in Burstall, West Yorkshire, on the 16th of June 2016. In addition, there's Michael Adebalagio, who was sentenced to spend the rest of his life in prison in 2014 for the murder of soldier Lee Rigby in May 2013. Also, Wayne Cousins, who, whilst a serving Metropolitan Police Officer in London, abducted, raped and murdered 33-year-old Sarah Everard in March 2021. Most recently, Ali Harvey Ali was given a whole life order for killing MP Sir David Ames in Leon C in Essex on the 15th of October 2021. However, Reynolds still remains, I believe, the youngest or potentially one of the youngest offenders to be given a whole life tariff with him receiving his when he was just 23 years old. I have no information about what Reynolds has been up to in prison. I read an article from a few years ago that says he's in the Monster Mansion, H&P Wakefield, surrounded by the most dangerous and perverted murderers and rapists in the country. So he's in good company then. Reynolds is now around 32 or 33 years old and so likely has a very long time to enjoy his surroundings and will hopefully, one day, die behind prison bars, utterly forgotten by the world. The murder of Georgia Williams laid bare serious failings in multi-agency working. The pieces were there, but no one bothered to put them together. It appears that two serious case reviews were commissioned, one which solely looked at West Mercia Police's role in this. Both were scathing, and the one from the police indicated that potentially disciplinary action was going to be taken towards officers involved in the previous instance. Whether this happened or not is unclear. The report made the usual recommendations to try and avoid something like this happening again. It's difficult to have faith in reports like this, as serious errors, albeit by other forces, continue to happen. For example, the colossal clusterfuck that was the investigation into the case of Stephen Port. George's parents, Stephen and Lynette, were obviously not only devastated by the loss of their daughter in such horrific circumstances, but also because Reynolds could have been stopped long before he snatched her away from them. I want to play this short clip about their reaction to the reports that were released. These officers in here um, shouldn't sleep at night because they let Georgia down. Their failings led to, to our daughter being killed by Reynolds. They killed Georgia by not dealing with him properly and they should accept some consequences for that. Even more terrible in this case is the fact that Stephen was a police officer with West Mercia Constabulary. It seems horribly perverse that a man who devoted his life to working for an organisation because he wanted to serve others was let down by that very same organisation when it came to protecting his own family. Georgia Williams was laid to rest on June the 14th, 2013 at St Albans Church in the town of Telford and her funeral was a sign of the young woman she was, how much she was loved and respected by those who knew her and the community as a whole. Her friends tied turquoise and orange ribbons, her favourite colours, along the entire funeral route. Hundreds of air cadets marched to the church from their headquarters and formed an honour guard for the mourners entering the service. Hundreds of pupils from Urkel Wood Technology College, where Georgia had previously been a head girl, also attended. Twenty police cadets marched into the church, in ranks of two as the church bells tolled, to mark the start of the service. The church, which held 450 people, was full to capacity, 
and the service was relayed via loudspeakers to the hundreds stood outside who had come to pay their respects. The service started with the song All Things Bright and Beautiful as this was felt to match George's character and all the mourners were told to wear bright colours to celebrate her life. Her father Stephen read out a poem written by one of her friends during the service which went quote We thought of you today but that is nothing new. We thought of you yesterday and the days before that too. We think of you in silence. We often speak your name. Now all we have is memories and your picture in a frame. Your memory is our keepsake with which we will never part. God now has you in his keeping, Georgia, but we will have you in our hearts. As a sign of the impact this tragedy had on the wider community, on the 17th of August 2013, a minute's applause was held before AFC Telford United's next football match. The club now gives a yearly award, known as the United for Georgia Trophy, to young volunteers at the club. The scale of the outpouring of respect and grief for this young woman is a testament to how much she was loved. I want to conclude this section by reading the statement from her father Stephen on behalf of the family, which they wrote before Reynolds' failed appeal in 2014. His words are more powerful than mine could ever be. Quote, It's now been one year and five months since pure evil took Georgia's life in the most cruel and unimaginable way possible. Georgia has now missed two birthdays, her 18th and 19th, Christmas and her sister's graduation and many other family occasions. Each of these days, which should have been joyous occasions, have been filled with grief beyond description for me, Georgia's mum, sister and the rest of the family. There are no joyous occasions for us anymore. There's just coping. If this isn't enough, we are here today to suffer and be put through anguish that we could all do without. To be honest, I'm surprised to be here today to listen to an appeal against the terms of punishment handed down by a Crown Court judge who had obviously considered every aspect of his sentencing options, who explored his reasoning with logic with regard to the laws of this land, with regard to the defendant, with regard to us, and just as importantly, to the rights of the public in the long term. This evil coward obviously doesn't accept that, but what he has to realise is that he was the master of his own destiny when he spent months planning George's death, with such detail and callousness, and then ultimately murdering her. Where is George's right to appeal? Where is our right to appeal against this life sentence that I can only describe as purgatory? There is none, even though I appeal to the highest authority over life and death every night when I pray to God to give Georgia her life back. A life where she would have continued to make her mark, doing good, serving her country in the RAF, making people happy, sticking up for right against wrong, and most importantly, for us, being part of the family in its journey through life. Georgia never harmed anyone, or ever would. She had save a life on her list for life. She wanted to be a paramedic and serve on the front line with the RAF. I know she would have achieved this and much more. Her life was, and still is, worth indefinitely more than the evil that appeals to this court today. She contributed to life, not took it away. Georgia only went to that house that evening because, in her words, he's a mate and I don't want to let him down. That was what she told her mum before she left that sunny evening. Evil took advantage of that good nature, that friendship, and used it to its own selfish, perverted pleasure, just for a few fleeting moments of self-gratification. That's all Georgia's friendship and life meant. That was the value put on this precious girl's life. Rot in hell, you inhuman excuse for life. I hope every day, for you, is full of the grief that twists my stomach into knots, that fills me with fear and apprehension, that makes me physically sick, that has no hope of ever going away, but eats further into you as each second of the day goes by. I hope you cry yourself to sleep every night and wake up every morning with the same stinging tears that burn into my eyes. I just wish you could experience the torture I go through every day without hope of even a moment's relief. Your heart should be ripped to shreds like mine, your waking moments restless without peace or solace, your life empty, and only then you may get somewhere near to what I feel and what torments me with never-ending frustration. Yes, I'm bitter. Yes, I'm twisted. This is what you have done to me. 
a man with only the needs for his family, and to do whatever good he could in life, and to pass those simple principles on to his children, to continue after he's gone. That is what I and the family suffer. Consider the real victim here. Dare to imagine the unimaginable. Place yourself in George's shoes, with a rope around your neck, with the inevitable knowledge of what is going to happen next. Try and imagine those last moments of life, spent in terror and struggle. Just try. God bless you, Georgia. Dad. The case of Jamie Reynolds is interesting for a number of reasons. Primarily, from my perspective, as a person who wants to understand why people do the things they do, it's the lack of any indication of serious issues in his childhood. As I said during the video, there were some indicators of abuse in Reynolds' childhood, but the psychiatrist who completed the report for his sentence said this was not serious or sustained enough to explain the seriousness of his own behaviour later in life. Obviously, this is an opinion, but I do tend to agree. I've covered many cases on here of serial murderers and other violent offenders. A significant trauma in their childhood is usually a factor which has shaped most of them into the people they became. But this isn't true with Reynolds. The more I do these videos, the more I'm becoming convinced that some people are just born evil. I want to clarify what I mean by that. Specifically, I'm coming around to the idea more and more that some people are born with some sort of neurological issues. There's simply something wrong with their brain development, and they could be raised in the most loving and caring household, and it wouldn't make any difference. They were still going to kill. Whatever was, or is, wrong in Reynolds' brain meant that his sole focus in life was sexual gratification from the abuse and murder of others. He saw the world very differently to other people. He saw those around him as things. He knew they were alive, but he didn't care or potentially understand that they were, in and of themselves, complex beings with hopes, dreams, desires, fears, etc. No, they were just sacks of meat who happened to share the same space as him. Watching violent pornography day in and day out for years showed him how he could use these objects to get a sense of power and also get sexual gratification. I think Reynolds saw himself as better than those around him and convinced himself that he was entitled and justified in acting in this way. The only person that mattered was him. What difference would it really make if he killed people to get what he wanted? As I said before, the act of strangulation is very visual. It's a horrific way to die and most of us, if we saw something like that in a film, we'd feel uncomfortable or turn away. Not Reynolds. That was the whole point. Seeing the agony in his victim's eyes, the hope and then the life draining from their face and knowing that he had caused that to happen. I've absolutely no doubt that the psychiatrist was right that Reynolds would have become a serial killer. I think he only didn't kill sooner because the victim he attacked in 2008 managed to fight him off and the girl he got into the house in February 2013 started to scream and resist. I think it's fascinating, but also horrifying, how much of Reynolds' life was solely devoted to murder and mayhem. He spent hours writing stories about it, editing pictures to fit his fantasies, and was relentless in trying to find a victim. I also believe that Reynolds, after killing Georgia, considered for a moment whether he could get her body out of the way and then return to the property in order to meet the other girls he'd invited round so he could kill again. I think the only reason he cancelled was not because his bloodlust was satiated, but purely for practical reasons, as he knew that moving her remains would take longer than he thought. I always find images or descriptions of the movements of killers after they've killed fascinating. I sometimes imagine myself in that situation, not often to be clear. How would I feel, knowing I'd done this? I think it would be a combination of blind panic and also fear knowing that at some point I was going to prison. In that situation, I couldn't act normally if you paid me. But with Reynolds, he went to the cinema and was acting totally normally, and I always find this complete disconnect really interesting. No doubt it reflects his underlying psychopathy, a complete inability to feel any remorse for his actions, but I also think that he was calm because, no matter what happened next, he'd achieved his aim. He'd lived out his fantasy and could revisit that memory over and over again. I imagine in the aftermath, Jamie Reynolds, the sadistic, sexual psychopath and necrophile that he is, was probably feeling very pleased with himself. So, what's your thoughts on this case? 
I'm particularly interested to hear what you think about the profile of Jamie Reynolds. So, if you like what I do here, then please consider becoming a channel member by clicking the join button. It's £2.99 a month, or around $4. Also, if you want to send a one-off donation to support the channel, then click the thanks button. Take care, and I'll see you in the next one.